Welcome to the Remedy video lecture series. This is lecture 9 and this lecture will discuss equitable defenses. Let's begin. Uh, we are going to discuss during this lecture five equitable defenses. The first will be latches, the second will be equitable estoppel, the third will be unclean hands, the fourth unconscionability, and the fifth election of remedies. Remember, these are generally equitable defenses and derive from the basic equitable princi principles that courts of equity are there to do justice and that courts of equity act with considerable discretion. And you will see that play out in each of these various defenses. In addition, the inability to pursue an equitable claim due to one of these defenses may not preclude legal remedies. They are independent of each other. So if for reason that the case, an equitable part of the case is dismissed because of latches or unclean hands, the plaintiff still could pursue their legal remedies. Let's begin. We're going to begin and talk about latches. Latches is very similar in some ways to a statute of limitations, but very different in other ways. The statute of limitations sets the time frame with w within which a suit must be brought. It is rather inflexible. If the statute starts to run and the statute is two years, on the date two years and one day after, in most instances, the statute will preclude a court from hearing the case. On the other hand, latches examines the reasonableness and consequences of the delay. That is, consequences we'll talk about later as prejudice. And it is a fairly flexible defense. Latches is also an affirmative defense that the party asserting must prove. It is also a very fact-intensive defense. It is not usually, in many instances, susceptible to pretrial resolution. It will only be resolved after an extensive hearing or after the court hears the entire matter. Let's take a look further at latches. Uh, latches really has a two-part focus. First part is the reasonableness of the delay and the second part is the prejudice to the party raising the defense. How were they harmed in some way as a result of the plaintiff not pursuing their cause of action? And what happens in this instance is courts will often balance the two. So the greater uh, the delay, uh, the weaker the reasonableness, a court will say that it, not as much prejudice will need to be shown where there is some reasonableness for the delay but much greater prejudice that may outweigh okay the elements of latches as i said earlier we're going to look to the reasonableness of the delay why the delay occurred and oftentimes courts will find that the delay no matter how long it is is reasonable when the party pursuing the cause of action, uh, usually the plaintiff, uh, was ignorant of the facts constituting the cause of action, was operating under a personal disability, either mental illness, uh, age, uh, or various other personal disabilities, or there were ongoing settlement negotiations. Um, Again, the court's going to look to why there was delay. Was it reasonable? What was the plaintiff doing during this time that would make the delay reasonable? Uh, the principal consideration is whether the plaintiff has acted with reasonable diligence in bringing their claim. That's what the court's going to try and examine. Did they sleep on their rights, as courts will say? The next part of this two-part test is prejudice. The unreasonable delay is not enough. The defendant must demonstrate prejudice as well. And the courts will often talk about two different types of prejudice. The first being evidentiary prejudice. As a result of the delay, there are fewer witnesses who are now available. Um, either they have disappeared, uh, they've died, uh, or their memories have faded. You know, if after a certain period of time 
uh, they can't remember what occurred, or other evidentiary uh, pieces are lost. Documents have been destroyed, computer files have been damaged. Uh, there is clearly, for a variety of reasons, uh, because of the delay, there is a, a lack of evidence uh, that the defendant can rely on to defend against the claim. The other part of prejudice is economic pre prejudice. That is a change in circumstances due to reliance on the status quo, due to the defendant relying on the fact that no one was pursuing a cause of action. This occurs when the defendant acted upon the failure to pursue a cause of action, uh, sold something that they might not have sold at a certain price, um, conducted business in a certain way that they wouldn't have done if they had known that they were going to be sued, etc. So these two pieces uh, uh, will always be examined by the court. The reasonableness of the delay and prejudice to the defendant in working out. And as you can see, these are pretty wide open uh, inquiries uh, that a court will conduct and they're not based just on the passing of time, which a statute of limitations is. And most discussions around the statute of limitations uh, doesn't revolve around why uh, the statutory period had expired. Here it clearly does. Uh, the next offense we're going to talk about in some ways is similar to latches, uh, but is also very different. This is equitable estoppel. Um, it's an equitable defense based on reliance and fairness. Again, you're back to the court of equity looking at the fairness of what has occurred, but it's also based on reliance. The person asserting the defense must prove by clear and convincing evidence uh, essentially six elements. Now there's some overlap in each of these elements as you will see, but the person asserting the defense must prove that the other person misrepresented or concealed facts the other person knew the mis knew of the misrepresentations, knew they were not true, or that the party would rely upon them. The party to whom the misrepresentations were made did not know that they were not true. Uh, the fourth element being the other person intended that the party claiming estoppel would rely on the representations. The party claiming estoppel reasonably did rely on them in good faith and to their detriment, and the party claiming estoppel would be prejudiced, would be harmed in some way by their reliance if the other party was permitted to deny them. And you'll see this play out uh, in a variety of ways where essentially uh, one party has led the other party to rely on certain facts and then changes course and now claims uh, that either the facts as given to them were not true and they relied upon them, but something has changed. But there has generally been reliance and reliance to their detriment on certain facts or action. The third of these defenses is the clean hands defense or unclean hands. And, you know, the basic premise of this defense, and as you'll see later it plays out, is to protect the integrity of the courts and not to benefit the asserting party. The asserting party may be benefited because the court will dismiss the um, equitable cause of action or the entire cause of action if it's solely based in equity, but that isn't its main purpose. Its main purpose is to protect the courts from being involved in wrongdoing. Uh, the focus is only on the party against whom the defense is asserted, not the party asserting it. So if the party against whom the defense is asserted has acted inappropriately and the party that wishes to assert the defense has also acted inappropriately, it will not bar the party asserting the defense from bringing this defense to the court. Now, there are essentially two elements to this defense. The first is serious misconduct. So if the defense is being asserted against a plaintiff, uh, the defendant would allege that the plaintiff has engaged in serious misconduct. And it's usually talking about intentional or highly reckless misconduct. 
and the second element here is that the misconduct must be sufficiently related to the rights being asserted by the plaintiff. If it is unrelated bad conduct, it will not be considered. So a court of equity will entertain a cause of action uh, from someone who is a bad actor or with a nefarious background if the cause of action is not tainted by the misconduct. The improper conduct must be a source or a part of the source of the plaintiff's equitable claim. So what the court is going to do here is examine the nature of the conduct and its relationship to the claim that the plaintiff has bringing. And if it finds that the conduct is sufficiently egregious and that it is related to the claim that the plaintiff is bringing, it has the authority based on the doctrine of unclean hands to dismiss the case and this will occur on a number of occasions. Uh, the, the fourth um, defense that we're going to look at and all of these are somewhat related is uh, unconscionability and this defense relates to contracts and the effect of certain sections or the entire contract. Um, the, the doctrine of unconscionability originated as an equitable defense but is now relied on in proceedings at law. It has been adopted by the UCC to apply to the sale of goods and a number of states will apply it in uh, causes of action that are brought at law. Uh, basically in, in, a, in a single sentence or statement uh, the, the doctrine of unconscionability breaks down to the absence of meaningful choice on the part of one of the parties to the contract plus contract terms that are unreasonably favorable to the other party. And you'll see this when you look at the cases how it can play out. Now the courts when they talk about uh, unconscionability they'll talk about it in two different ways. The first is they'll talk about procedural unconscionability and here it seems to break down into two different parts. Oppression. That is the contract involves a lack of negotiation and meaningful choice. It is often referred to as a take it or leave it terms. Uh, the second piece to this is surprise. The unconscionable provision is somewhere hidden in the contract written in language that no one could understand, um, is uh, buried in the small fine print of the contract so that when it comes about the defendant can claim that they were totally surprised by the contract. These are two different pieces of procedural unconscionability. The second piece to this is substantive unconscionability. The contract provision reallocates risk in an objectively unreasonable or unexpected manner. This really looks to the one-sidedness of the contract, placing all of the burdens or all of the uh, unfairness on one side, giving advantage to one party significantly over the other. So these two are there. Now what you see in unconscionability is that relief uh, that can be obtained can either void a section of the contract because remember this originated in equity where courts had great discretion to in how they granted relief so they could void one section of the contract or they could void the entire contract. And in deciding whether how far the unconscionability should go in voiding uh, the contract, court looks to see if the objectionable sections infect the entire contract or just part of it. If a court finds that it will infect the entire contract, it may void the entire contract, but it has the option to select certain provisions and just to void them out. Um, the issue of unconscionability is one of law and is decided by a court, by the court, not by a jury. And finally, courts deal with unconscionability, the two issues, the procedural unconscionability and substantive unconscionability in two different ways. Some courts apply a sliding scale. 
the more procedural unconscionability that is there, they will require less of a showing of substantive unconscionability, and vice versa. And um, other courts will only require that one or the other uh, be demonstrated, so that if a in those jurisdictions, if a, pl if a defendant who is asserting the defense of unconscionability can show that there was procedural unconscionability alone, uh, they may prevail. Uh, in a court that requires a sliding scale, the defendant will have to show both procedural and substantive unconscionability to a certain extent. The final remedy, final um, defense, excuse me there, that I'm going to talk about is uh, referred to as election of remedies. Uh, often a plaintiff will have several viable remedies that they may pursue. So for example, in the contract setting, uh, they where there has been an alleged breach of contract, uh, a plaintiff uh, may bring uh, a cause of action seeking specific performance or may have as an option uh, bring an action seeking specific performance in equity and damages for breach of contract at law. And under the doctrine of election of remedies, this doctrine required that the election to bring one or the other um, had to occur prior to bringing the causes of action. And that once the uh, plaintiff had taken some action relying on the chosen remedy, uh, they would then be precluded from asserting other remedies. Uh, there are two policies that underlie uh, this doctrine, the doctrine of election of remedies. One is to prevent, obviously, double recovery. You know, in our specific performance damages, breach of contract uh, example above, if the plaintiff were to obtain specific performance, they could not then recover damages as well because they would be getting performance under their contract and on top of that obtaining damages for breach of the contract and they would be getting double recovery. Um, the other p policy consideration in this section is preventing undue prejudice to the defendant. So if the defendant has relied upon the uh, plaintiff bringing one cause of action or taking an action consistent with bringing one cause of action. For example, bringing an action for breach of contract and has relied upon that and uh, is no longer in a position to specifically perform because they think they're going to have to pay damages. Uh, and now all of a sudden the court orders them to specifically perform at great cost to them. This will unduly prejudice the defendant. Uh, there were three elements to the traditional um, election of remedies uh, uh, doctrine. Uh, the first is that two or more remedies existed at the time of the election, at the time the plaintiff did something uh, consistent with one of those remedies. Uh, and the remedies must be inconsistent with each other, obviously. If they're not inconsistent, there's not a problem. And the, the party bound must have affirmatively chosen the available remedies. They must have done something to affirmatively have selected one of their remedies. Under the traditional test, if all three of these factors are met, the court will find that the plaintiff has elected a remedy and may preclude the plaintiff from pursuing other remedies that are inconsistent with the remedy they have chosen. Um, as I said earlier, the doctrine of election of remedies has been rejected in many jurisdictions and by the UCC. Uh, Section 2 of the UCC uh, clearly and specifically rejects the election of remedies. And instead, today, the current focus is upon double recovery and reliance by one of the parties. So the, the election of remedies doctrine comes into play in jurisdictions that have, re have rejected it when there is the potential for double recovery. The plaintiff cannot recover, in essence, the same damages from two parties or the same damages plus in you know specific performance from uh, 
the 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 defendant um, and the courts will therefore focus on whether there's a double recovery or some kind of significant reliance to their detriment of the plaintiff pursuing one of the remedies versus others. This now concludes uh, this video lecture uh, for now and as, as I've always reminded you at the end you need to go to the TWIN site and fill out the assessment for video lecture number nine election uh, def equitable defenses. Thank you.